for that over the top welcome. Uh, so uh, my title is kind of a mouthful. Uh, it's not even really so important. Uh, what I'm really here to talk about is open government. Uh, and that means, that is a very broad word. That means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, as you might imagine, that's the only kind of word that can really lead a movement, but it also means we have a lot of people working on a lot of different things. Uh, there's a whole sector of people working around influence, uh, data around corruption, looking at how lobbyists influence the system, uh, and that's you know, that's a, a very valid, very important sector. Uh, there's also another, is, uh, journalists often fall into this, there's a lot of people who think that open government is about the Freedom of Information Act, it's about secret courts and, and FISA, uh, and executive privilege, and all of this stuff, a lot of the battles that you hear about in the news. Uh, there's also something that's a little more relatively new, which is there's been a focus on data. Uh, so this isn't really going to be a super technical talk, uh, like some of the others. Um, I'm going to bounce around to a lot of different stuff. Um, but uh, a lot of it's going to be about what's been happening with data. Uh, the idea now is this government hasn't really concerned itself with data all that much. But right now, we want as much as possible, uh, even the boring stuff. Uh, stuff about bats and birds, whatever, uh, and that's not boring to everybody. And we want it in machine-readable formats. And this stuff, uh, you know, three, four years ago, was very much a sort of pipe dream call on the part of a small open government community. And, but this stuff is, is a lot more, is, is actually happening now. I'm going to show you a lot of examples of that. Uh, another way that people look at open government as, as a word, as a movement, is this idea of government, uh, how, how it actually acts, how it behaves. So we want a government that's participatory and responsive and transparent in the way, in the way it acts. Uh, and I come from DC, which is a world of happy hours and meetups and bar, all these bar camps uh, and a lot, of, a lot of focus on new media and all this stuff. And so, you know, you hear the term 2.0 going around a lot. Well, we're, we've been used to hearing the word web 2.0 for a while, for years now. We know how much it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, now there's the term gov 2.0 has been a huge uh, word, another big sort of word that means a lot of different things. And, you know, I, I just have a real problem with uh, appending 2.0 on the end of things. I mean, we're the people who invented version <coughs> numbers, and real progress means minor version numbers. It means a lot of things. It means a lot of incremental improvement, uh, it means alphas, you know, it means betas, it means people taking risks, it means failing, sometimes very public failure, it means sorrow and recrimination and betrayal. It means a lot of things. Uh, but ultimately you end up shipping something. So what I want to what I want to go over now for a little while uh, is what people in the government and out of it have been shipping. So uh, there's, there's been a lot of stuff happening at the local level and the state level and the national level. So starting out with San Francisco, uh, ignoring the hideous binary header at the top, there's actually quite a bit of data that San Francisco, this is an official website of the San Francisco government, and they put out data about the environment, about housing, about crime, uh, and uh, you know, they have an app showcase of stuff that people who aren't in the San Francisco government have made, uh, including something that probably a lot of people here would find useful. Uh, there's a list of, this is kept up to date over the last several days, uh, last months, however long, um, showing you where all the stuff's been happening. Uh, I sort of think of this as the, uh, as sort of the, the uh, um, there's, there's a lot of different stuff, but a lot of this focuses on crime and mobile apps and the BART system and public transit. Uh, that's what a lot of people have been building. And that's, and that's really useful and really interesting. And crime is actually a fairly touchy subject. Uh, back in 2005, there was something called, uh, basically, uh, Adrian Holabody, who runs the Django Project, and I can't link to this to you, it's not uh, available anymore, but uh, he took the, the list, the Chicago crime blotter, that was being published online, just in some HTML, and then he basically matched up with a Google map. This is before the Google Maps API was around. So he actually reverse engineered Google Maps and JavaScript and embedded all of the recent Chicago crime onto a map. And this was a big deal in Chicago. And the police department was weirded out by this, and people were taking or printing out things from the site and bringing it to meetings around the town. Uh, and it, the reason it's, it's not available is because uh, Adrian Holabody eventually went and made, oh, that's not the right, oh, I'm not connected, I'm not. Uh, 
in the, the, in the arc of things, the, the stuff I'm talking about here doesn't have much to do with the administration, uh, and more just to do with how things have been going for a long time. Uh, so this is, this is a, a catalog of data, and it's not so much about hosting uh, original data that the government produced just for the site. It's actually about taking the data that various federal agencies have been publishing all over the place already, and, but actually telling people where they all are. So having a central place you can go to look all this up. So if you're concerned about the recall on eggs, you can go and look at the Food and Drug Administration's uh, set of recalls they actually put out. And I mean, this is, uh, in this particular case, it's an RSS feed. Um, a lot of this stuff um, is, is genuinely raw, it comes in CSV or XML. They've actually had a bigger focus on RDF lately. Uh, so but there's, there's stuff in all sorts of formats. And this, I mean, they include links to the census to uh, things all over the place. Uh, so, one of, so now I'm actually going to get a little bit into uh, some of the things people have done. Uh, I'm going to bounce back and forth, but this is flyontime.us. So this uh, actually came out of a contest that Sunlight ran, uh, which we were inspired by the Apps for Democracy contest that DC ran. So we ran a contest called Apps for America. This is actually the second one we ran. Uh, and we challenged people to use data in data.gov just to, to build whatever they wanted. And somebody went and saw the Federal Aviation Administration that went and published all of those crazy statistics that they keep. The FAA actually keeps statistics on how long your plane sits on the tarmac, uh, when, it's at, when its wheels go up, any delays it suffers over time, like when it arrives down the minute. It actually breaks up all of the delays into fairly granular pieces. So, but it's, it, of course, it's not in a very easy format to process or anything, but it is machine readable. So this person, in, in fact, if you go to kayak.com, and you go and search for a flight, you might notice that Kayak provides a little percentage of time where your flight, the sort of uh, probability of judging by the past that your flight will be delayed or not. And then they use data from the FAA, uh, and that's part of their business model. So this, this site is just done for free, it's open source, uh, it's a Rails app. And he took the FAA data and made an actual searchable city, uh, or searchable website, I mean, uh, so that you can actually see uh, what your flight is. So going from San Francisco to DC, uh, you can see what the best time of day is or the time of week. Uh, you know all of these things. You know ways things happen on holidays, and of course that's where it's, it's even telling you the current delay is happening right there at SFO. Um, and there's much more you can do. And the site, of course, also has its own little RESTful API. So all of the the data that was uh, either sort of hard to get from FAA, hard to parse, it's not in an easy format. Uh, and stuff that Kayak was using to is using to, to base its business on is now just even more free and even more easy to use just as a public service. And this was just done as part of this contest as a, sort of a random person uh, who wanted to, to do something good. Uh, bouncing back to something that the administration or that the uh, the government has made, this actually dates back a while. This is uh, USAspending.gov, and the idea is that you're uh, it's, it's all the things that the government spends on. Um, so it's, it's the way its budget breaks down, all the contracts it gets, all the grants that it gives out, loans, all of this stuff. And uh, this was made by uh, a, a collaboration between then Senator Obama and Senator, uh, Senator Coburn of Oklahoma, who is one of the most conservative, fiscally conservative uh, people there is in the Senate right now. So this, uh, but they both came around and they agreed that there should be better transparency, and so they, they passed a bill mandating usaspending.gov, which publishes things, and not just in pretty graphs and visualizations, but also you can actually get XML and CSV, and CSV and all of this stuff. Um, so it's, it is a, it's a powerful tool, and this has been around for a while. It's been around since, um, I'm actually not sure of the date, but uh, pre-2008 certainly, I think around 2006. And it's gone through a couple of redesigns, but this is also an example that not all data that's been published is necessarily of awesome quality. Um, I would be remiss in mentioning USA Spending, not to mention a project that my organization, Sunlight Foundation, just did. Uh, we've just launched this last week. It's called Clear Spending, uh, which basically analyzes USAspending.gov's reliability based on other methods of reporting that various government agencies do on how they actually spend the money, and found a, uh, as you can see, a well over a trillion dollars of misreported funds. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is quite another big big risk and a failure, and this is, this is pretty substantial though. This is, this is rather systemic. Um, and and uh, you know, some of this 
is actually just people not typing in the right amount of zeros. Uh, and this is just because we've actually talked to people at USA spending and tracks them that down. That's some of it, but that's not all of it. Because another part of it is, is really just a, a function of large bureaucracies and people not knowing what other people are doing and, and also just a lack of priority on ensuring that what they're reporting is accurate. What they're reporting to USA spending is the same thing as they're reporting to their actual like, boss internally. Uh, and that's, the, this is a tension, uh, right? We, we want the government to get this out there. We want the government to get data out there. And it's a win when they do, but we also, it's, it's really important to actually ensure this is a good quality, it's useful to do. Um, this isn't an example of how, of like, how bad all, all attempts are at getting the spending data out there, but it is a useful exercise, a uh, very useful exercise in figuring out what some of the problems are. Uh, so, go, going uh, over to the legislative branch, this is something that's been around for a long time. Um, this is the Library of Congress, known as Thomas. And Thomas doesn't really put out things in machine readable formats, but it is at least there uh, in, a, in HTML. So, if you're. Uh, good. Um, so, this does have, for any given bill, it has everything that's ever happened to it, its entire text, uh, its co sponsors, and uh, related documents and all this stuff. And even despite the fact that this doesn't put out anything in, in really in actual machine readable stuff, people have done good work anyway. So this is probably, I mean, this was done in 2004. This is govtrack.us, and it's, it's, a, it's a website that not enough people know about and not enough people really understand the importance of. Because govtrack isn't, isn't only a front end to uh, everything that's happening in terms of bills and members of Congress. But they actually uh, publish all of their data for free uh, in XML uh, for everything that's ever happened. And they do this by scraping comps and turning this into an actual, like a, a, a comprehensive data source that the public can build things off of. And people have built things off of this. So this is Open Congress. Uh, this is a, a web. This is a Rails app. Uh, this has been around for a few years. Uh, it's built off of GovTracks data. Uh, which is in turn built off of Thomas, and there you can do it's everything that you think it is. So, uh, and it's a it's a community website where people go and actually talk about things and vote on things, and you, uh, you can see what's actually happening. Uh, and the, so it's, this, is, this is not new. This is not exactly you know, this, this has been around for years, but this is extremely important. And stuff like this, so stuff like GovTrack going and scraping Thomas to create XML, has actually successfully motivated the. House of Representatives in the Senate to publish this stuff in XML themselves, uh, at least votes right now. So the voting as it occurs in the House of Representatives is published uh, in, in XML, uh, this is an example, uh, within a few minutes of its passage. So it's starting to become possible to actually see votes happening in real time and build apps that respond to that. It's actually something that uh, I and some others in my organization are going to be working with uh, over the next year or so. Uh, but if there, anybody could be doing this, and the Senate also has XML, uh, of course, in a totally different format. Uh, there's no communication, really, between the two bodies. They're totally different times, for different reasons, use different unique identifiers. Uh, so there's not, it's, it's still not trivial, but it's there, and that's, that's the important part. Um, so the, uh, uh, st sticking with the legislative branch, uh, at the state level, State level is a really fascinating place because this is often where a lot of things happen that more directly affect people and their daily lives. So people are starting a small business uh, in their state. I mean, certainly federal legislation matters to them, but often where they're going to have what the legislation that has the most impact and their elected officials where they can have the most impact is going to be at the state level. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen over the last few years is that uh, journalist attention and public attention and all of this stuff at the state level has been diminishing. Uh, as uh, traditional news organizations have been shrinking in favor of uh, blogs and uh, sort of things that are halfway between blogs and, and reporting and all this stuff. Um, so if I knew how to turn these notifications off, I would, if I did not figure that out at the top, but I appreciate all of this. So, uh, <laughs> if I wasn't on camera, I'd give you the finger. But uh, <laughs> so the, uh, this is the New York State Senate, and uh, the, they have an open legislative API. Uh, 
so they actually give out all of their legislation and, and basically in close to real time and JSON and XML. And that's great, but there are 49 other states, uh, and some, actually California as well gives out, I could, I could load it up, but California also has a legislative API, but that's, uh, and that's great, it's still, nowhere near 50 states are giving out their legislative information and in anything regarding an open standard or anything like that. So um, I should also mention that one of the projects Sunlight does is this thing called the Open State Project in which we are working on a whole bunch of different scrapers that go over the various 50 state legislature websites, or in some cases their FTP uh, place where they store all their legislation. Uh, and we, we actually try to make this a standard. Um, it's actually and it's based on, the, the, this project in particular is written in Python and based on Mongo. Uh, and we store, it's, it's especially important that we use Mongo actually, especially useful. Um, because as you might imagine, all the different states have extremely different sets of data and requirements and rules and all of this stuff. And it's very useful to have that kind of flexibility even at the database level. Uh, and it's, it's actually, it can be very different. Not everybody knows that Nebraska has a unicameral legislature, for instance. They don't have two houses in the legislature, just one. Um, and there's, there's stuff that's far more subtle than that that can be a real challenge. And so we actually have, including California, um, we've we've put, started uh, publishing this information so now that we've launched this API where people can start pulling down uh, legislative data at the state level. So that's really cool as well. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my talk here for a second. Uh, I'm very graceful. Uh, so there, uh, I mentioned before that I want to, I want to tell a story now about a particular project that I thought was, was particularly inspiring. So as I mentioned, that we hosted a contest uh, around information from data.gov. Uh, in uh, just in the last year, and a few a few Ruby developers, uh, Bob Burbeck, David Augustine, and Andrew Carpenter, who they work for a school's nonprofit uh, in the West, uh, in the West Coast, and they they had never really heard of open government before, but they heard of the contest. They they they, they were exposed to the idea of open government, and so they went to OpenGovernment.gov. Uh, and they eventually found the Federal Register. Uh, I actually have to see a show of hands. Anybody, who here knows what the Federal Register is? Yeah, not very many people, actually. That was maybe a, a 15th of you guys. Um, federal Register is, is one of the more important publications that the federal government does. It's the official journal of the government. It covers a lot of things. Uh, any public notices that things are going to happen, any notices that there are uh, rulemaking uh, sessions about to happen, Chances for public comment. Um, I don't know if you guys are, uh, if you've you know, seen the news with these huge sweeping legislative packages of the healthcare bill and financial regulatory reform. Uh, one of the narratives around this too is that the real, the real battle uh, with lobbyists and all the sausage making doesn't just occur when the bill is actually being made and passed. It occurs afterwards when the regulations are actually being drafted. Uh, there's an incredible amount of latitude uh, for, you know, for good reasons. There's an incredible amount of latitude how to actually execute on the law, and so there's a, a long period of time where regulations get made. And so the, the advantage that a lot of uh, special interests and lobbyists have in this process is that they know what the Federal Register is, and that they know where all these things are happening, and they will go to them, and they will give their public uh, and So these people, I guess I do forget that slide. So these, uh, the Federal Register is published by the Office of the Federal Register, just a subset of the government printing office. Uh, and so these, these three developers that I mentioned went and for this contest took the Federal Register and they made something called GovPulse, uh, which uh, was one of the winners of this contest because it was that impressive and then it took something that is very important and they started actually showed it in a very relevant way. So it showed it uh, by stuff that's happening now. You can see it automatically geolocated me. There's somewhere around San Francisco and it's showing me events that are happening near me. Uh, things that have opened in the last few days, closed in the next seven days, uh, showing little spark lines for activity of what's happening in, in all the different federal agencies, the different sectors. Um, and that's really cool. That was a really great project. This is a Rails app, um, and it's open source on GitHub. Uh, so what was especially cool about this, though, uh, as, as time went by, is that eventually, in March, the government called and thought this was wonderful. Uh, like Office of the Federal Register could, could tell pretty quickly that this was the right way to go. This is way better than anything that they're doing already. 
so they, they wanted they wanted to work with these guys and make it actually happen. So uh, and they were serious. So they, they cut through some red tape. They uh, brought in these three developers as sort of a sub sub subcontractor on an existing contract. Uh, so they didn't have to go through a formal request uh, for proposals. Um, and the, when they were going through the process, they actually really wanted to take some risks. Uh, the, the design that, that these guys uh, originally proposed for this new federal register site is fairly conservative, and that's not what the government wanted. So they wanted something really pretty, really daring, or notably different than what people expect from a government website. Uh, and of course, this would never have been possible if they didn't get actual buy-in from the top of the agency. Uh, and so they were actually able to make something happen in three months. Uh, which is not the usual time frame for government projects of any kind, even things much smaller than the register. Uh, and so the, the developers in question here, uh, Bob and, and his crew, cut their hours at work at their nonprofit by 40%. The, their, their employer was extremely gracious in this regard. And of course, they end up benefiting later because a lot of the expertise and all the challenges that these guys had to go through to make the site, they're able to bring back into the work at the end of it. Uh, it's still quite a good sacrifice. And this website is Ruby on Rails, Amazon EC2 is what it's hosted on. It's still open source. The government also doesn't open source much. Um, that's not something that the government lawyers tend to understand very much. Um, they tend to be wary about it, but they just did it. Uh, and so now we have federalregister.gov. This is an actual brand new piece of government property. Uh, this is the, this is an official website for the Federal Register. Uh, there's a wealth of information on it, uh, you know, broken down by sector. And, and, uh, and the, the people at the GPO actually made a video to try to help people understand how to use it. Uh, there's a great deal of commitment behind this. This just launched a couple months ago. And this is, I, I, I think this is amazing. I think it's absolutely amazing that just be, because these three guys felt like doing something on their own, essentially on their own time, well it was on their own time for the for gov calls. Uh, and then they made it work to actually work with the government to make it uh, something brand new. Um, I think Bob is here, isn't he? He said he, said he would be. Is, is, yeah, okay. He's here. I, I, honestly, he's probably gave us, I think he and his team deserve a round of applause. something of a sea change. Um, and I know that, uh, it, and as I said, it's not about a particular administration, it's not about the politics of the matter. This stuff is going to happen anyway. This stuff is going to happen, it's going to continue happening. The momentum is way too great for, for it to not keep moving. The thing that's a sea change about it is the government is actually viewing developers as one of their customers. Uh, and that's, frequently when you go to government and you try to argue with them to put out stuff like their records in CSV uh, or in XML or whatever, well, their argument is that that's not what citizens want. Citizens don't get that. Like, the, it's, there's no point to it. The government's time would be better spent making visualizations and graphs in the state. Um, and changing their minds on that and convincing them that there is a significant minority of developers that can act as a force multiplier on that data and can go out and create their own apps, mobile and website apps. To, to do that is, the fact that that's happening is very significant. And as, a, as I've shown, developers are starting to get back to government, not just the Bill Pulse guys, but uh, people all over the place. People that come to uh, various hackathons and meetings, show up at open government meetups, uh, people that actually go and talk with people in the local government, there's all sorts of things happening. Um, I hope that that's been, that's been clear. I also hope it's been clear that there could be a lot of cooler stuff happening. Uh, there's, I mean, I, you know, I'm showing a lot of data, these data catalogs and stuff, but there's a lot more that can be done. There's a huge amount of potential, and a lot of people in government have worked really hard to create that potential. Uh, I, I would call it something more like Government 1.3, where we are right now. Uh, it's, there's been a, a, a huge amount of advances, uh, and getting, getting all this stuff done is a, is a huge win, but there's so much more to do. The trend is very positive, though, and so I want to talk a little bit about America. Uh, it's kind of hard for a lot of people to talk about in an honest way. But, uh, and you know, if, if, when you look at stuff through the lens of 
secret courts and executive privilege and, and all this stuff, people have a lot of complicated feelings about America. Um, and that's well, well understood. But there's a lot of things that are very good about what the U.S. has stood for uh, in regards to open government. America is the first country in the world to have a Freedom of Information Act. It's back in the 60s, and it's been strengthened in generations since. Uh, it's in 2000, the year 2000, that, uh, when I say the year 2000, it sounds like the future, but I assure you it's the past. Uh, Britain had its own first uh, Freedom of Information Act. And it's actually even better than ours. Uh, the British Freedom of Information Act, uh, why don't I just bring this up, um, uh, mandates that any, that they actually accept electronic Freedom of Information requests, and they have to respond in the same format that they got. So, uh, this is a, a website made by My Society, where you can submit a Freedom of Information request through the site, and the site will request it on your behalf. And when it gets the electronic response, it'll publish it on its website. So now you have and have a public record of all these freedom of information requests happening uh, publicly. Not, not, that's actually not something that we can do yet. But this is something that America is led on. There's also something that's unusual about America, is that uh, all of the government's information that it produces, its reports, its data, is public domain. That is, that is not at all the case in every country, even though it sounds like something that, we should, that it should be, but it's something that we take for granted. So we have a lot of freedom here to set a really amazing example. What we do continues to matter. Uh, when, when, we, when we do something like put up data.gov, and we have various cities and states doing their own data catalogs, this is stuff that a lot of other people from around the world take notice. And when citizens actually step up and make things off of it, and, and you can actually viscerally see this relationship developing, it's another thing that a lot of countries notice. So what we do here matters, uh, but it matters in the strength of its citizens, and that's you guys. So, uh, I mean, as far as what you guys should be doing, as far as the challenges, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it's, it's also easy. You should be talking with other people. There are various meetups that happen at, at cities all over. I know Bob is trying to start one here in San Francisco. There's stuff that's been happening in New York City uh, for a while. Um, they've been. Uh, Open government meetup group there that's uh, been doing a lot of work on Open 311 uh, standard for 311, 311 requests uh, that actually the, the White House has taken up and started working with them on. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, data out there that's coming up or that is out there now. There's uh, state legislative data that I talked about. The 2010 census is basically done, uh, they'll publish their data next year. The 2000 census has been out for a while and their data is machine readable if you can understand 300-page uh, PDFs uh, that document how to read through their uh, bit-limited uh, fields. Hopefully it'll be a little better this time around, but even if not, people have written uh, Ruby libraries and other libraries around this data, and the census data is some of the most valuable, uh, rich data that our government produces ever. Uh, so that's going to be something to look for. There's a lot of data around money and politics coming out. One of the things that Sunlight's uh, worked on is uh, transparency data, where we there's campaign contributions and lobby at the federal and state level, lobbying data, grant data, and this stuff is all being offered via API. And lots of other people have done this too, at, at different levels. Uh, Open Secrets offers uh, bulk data uh, about what's happening at inside the Capitol, and that's that's stuff that not only needs a lot of action built around it, but also needs a lot of analysis and a lot of attention. Uh, and also, it's important to know that people in the government actually will help you, that most people are very friendly. And, and as I said, the reason that it's not because, the reason that it's not about the administration or the politics is that what's been happening, it's really been happening at the level of civil servants. That there's a lot of people in the government who really believe in doing this stuff. Uh, and the thing that's, that's going to let you, that the, one of the reasons that people in the government will help you is that you guys in this room, you're not a crazy person. Uh, if you look at a lot of the participation sites that the government has set up, uh, you will see that there are a lot of crazy people uh, that cause the government to be the defensive, uh, take no risks thing that, that they are. Um, but you're not crazy, and it will become quickly apparent that you're not. And I think you'll find a lot of allies who have ideas uh, that you want to do. So I would say to all of you, uh, look, just look around you. Just, you know, look around what's happening in your local community. San Francisco has a lot of problems. So besides how awesome San Francisco is, obviously, San Francisco also has a lot of visible problems in it. So does the state of California. Its government is a mess. Uh, 
And so you should find plenty of inspiration for things around it that you want to do. And it, does, it, it also might be things that just you care about. Maybe you care about public gardens and public parks in the city. Maybe you care about parking because you have a car and you commute to work. It's, it's, it doesn't really matter. It's just a different way of thinking about what's around you. <coughs> so all I can really say is just be a part of public life and start caring and just know that a lot of other people are caring and working on things right now. Um, and contribute a commit to Government 1.4. Uh, it, could, it, could it could be anything at all. And that, that could mean a lot of different things, but I'm sure you'll find something. Thanks very much for your time.